The theme of this lecture is the dissolution of the monasteries in England. Before we begin, it's worth noting that dissolutions of monasteries were something that happened regularly during the late Middle Ages. If a monastery became too small or an Episcopal visitation judged the monastery too corrupt, it was not uncommon for a bishop to decide that that monastery no longer served its purpose and should be dissolved. But these dissolutions happened at a local level as occasional incidents. They were not something which was planned, extensive, and in the case of the dissolution that took place between 1536 and 1540, total. The first hint that we have in English history of something approaching an organised, planned and predatory dissolution of monasteries occurred from 1525, mostly located in Suffolk, where Cardinal Wolsey decided that he was going to dissolve systematically a number of smaller monasteries in order to support his new foundation of a college in Ipswich. Now he had the power to do this because he was a papal legate a latere, and therefore he had full plenipotentiary power to dissolve any monastery he chose. He therefore targeted a number of smaller monasteries and diverted their income, their appropriated parishes and so forth to the support of his new college that he'd founded in Ipswich. And in some ways that en masse dissolution that Wolsey attempted, which happened mostly in Suffolk, formed a template for what was going to happen in the 1530s. And so we come to the question of why Henry VIII dissolved the monasteries. This is a more difficult qu question to answer than it might seem. In the older historiography of the dissolution, the answer was fairly simple, and it was down to Henry's greed. He wanted more money, he saw the dissolution of the monasteries as an opportunity of, to obtain that money because monasteries no longer served an important function in the religious settlement that he had created through the Act of Supremacy, and therefore the dissolution of the monasteries was the obvious thing to do. And furthermore, his chief minister, Thomas Cromwell, had a reforming agenda in which he was opposed to monastic life and was eager to carry out the king's wishes. But it seems that the picture was not quite so simple. Because it may well be that financial motives eventually took over in the process of the dissolution. And it's certainly true that stone from the monasteries was used in order to build Henry's shore forts. But it is unlikely that the dissolution began with purely financial motives in mind. Now, it's a, a standard cliche of early modern English historiography to remind you that Henry VIII was not a Protestant. He was never a Protestant. He never had Protestant convictions in the way that we might understand them, or certainly in the way that Martin Luther would have understood them. But Henry was a reformist, and in particular, he seems to have had Erasmian convictions derived from the writings of Desiderius Erasmus, who, whilst he always remained a Catholic, was highly critical of Catholic piety and late medieval Catholic religious practices. And things that we could point to in Henry's views that were Erasmian were a great deal of reverence for scripture. It was, after all, an interpretation of the book of Leviticus that sent Henry into a tailspin and made him worry about the validity of his marriage to Catherine of Aragon. His opposition to purgatory, since the doctrine of purgatory was seen as the source of many abuses by the followers of Erasmus, and a certain lukewarmness towards the cult of saints, which again is something that we can find in Erasmus's writings. And the trope of monks as ignorant, lazy, useless parasites is something that we find in Erasmian writings. So Henry may well have begun his dissolution of the monasteries with a genuine religious agenda, an Erasmian religious agenda. But Henry's vicegerent in matters spiritual, Thomas Cromwell, definitely had a more reforming agenda that was rooted in the theological ideas of the Reformation. Henry lacked a coherent policy, and one indication of that is that he actually, as late as 1537, founded a new monastery whose purpose was to pray for the soul of his wife, Jane Seymour, and this was in the midst of dissolving all of the monasteries. Thomas Cromwell, however, certainly did have a coherent policy and intended to dissolve all of the monasteries. Whether Henry VIII ever intended personally to dissolve every single monastery in England is one of the more interesting questions about the dissolution, and we simply don't know the answer. But I think it's pretty clear that Thomas Cromwell did intend the dissolution to be total. The Act for the Dissolution of the Lesser Religious Houses was passed by Parliament in 1536, 
and that dissolved any house with an income of under £200 a year. In some respects, that dissolution was not all that different from what had been happening in the late Middle Ages and Wolsey's dissolutions, with the difference that those had not been supported by statute. They had simply been decisions made by individual bishops, or in the case of Cardinal Wolsey, a papal legate. But that effectively resulted in the dissolution of most nunneries and most smaller religious houses with five or six monks, those small cells that had proliferated throughout the Middle Ages. In 1538, the friaries were also dissolved. The friaries were not covered by the dissolution of the, greater, of the smaller religious houses, and that was because the friaries had no income whatsoever, but they were not included in the, uh, in the stipulations of that act. But the dissolution of the friaries was motivated not so much by financial considerations, but by a perception that the friars were not loyal to Henry's supremacy. Many friars had spoken out against the idea of Henry usurping the role of the Pope, and in fact, the religious orders of the friars were closely linked to generals in Rome who governed those orders, and therefore it was rather difficult for the friars to continue existing in a situation where Henry declared himself to be supreme head of the church in England. But the heads of the greater religious houses, those with vast incomes that greatly exceeded £200, still believed after 1536 that they might be spared and that those religious houses might survive. And they did so with good reason. In many cases, they were royal religious houses, houses of royal foundation. Henry VIII, therefore, was considered to be their founder. Their entire purpose was to pray for his soul and the soul of his ancestors. Furthermore, they had, in most cases, gladly accepted the supremacy back in 1535, and they considered that that should keep them safe. In 1535 to 1536, Cromwell sent round commissioners who compiled the Valor Ecclesiasticus that effectively valued all of the possessions and buildings of the religious houses. This was followed by a general visitation by Cromwell's commissioners, who in many cases stripped the gold and jewels from shrines, confiscated things like relics and plate, and they tended to report scandals in the monasteries. Some of these scandals perhaps did have basis in fact, others seem to have been confected in order to meet that requirement of the story of lazy, ignorant and useless monks that fitted that idea of Erasmus that monks were essentially an outdated and useless institution. There was a certain degree of resistance to dissolution, most notably the Carthusians of the London Charter House all to a man refused not only to dissolve their house, but also refused the royal supremacy, as a result of which they were all hanged, drawn and quartered for treason. Furthermore, the Brigitines of Zion, another very severe religious order in London, also refused to accept the, uh, the, the supremacy. Some of them were put to death and the rest of them went into exile. The abbots of Glastonbury and Reading also refused and were executed, refused to dissolve, dissolve and surrender their houses, as was the Augustinian abbot of Colchester. But with those exceptions, most heads of religious houses gladly accepted the supremacy and gladly accepted the lavish pensions that they were offered by Henry and surrendered their houses to the commissioners. The Act for the Dissolution of the Greater Religious Houses in 1539 made clear that England would be a land without monasteries. And the dissolution often happened without ceremony. At Evesham Abbey, for example, the commissioners arrived while the monks were singing vespers. And the chronicle of the abbey recorded that the commissioners would not allow the monks even to finish the singing of the Magnificat before they marched into the choir and confiscated the abbey. The last of the abbeys, Waltham Abbey, was dissolved on the 23rd of March, 1540, and thus ended monasticism in England.